Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear guests, participants. Thank you for being more on time than myself. We should have started five, five minutes ago. Uh, but um, we are going to have on the next session Mr. Jens Mohr. He is the Secretary General of IDLR in Germany. And um, he told me that as, that as being German, time will not be a problem on this session, right? You told me that. So that's OK. I thank you. But I would like to highlight the presence of um, uh, IDLR um, responsibles on this conference. Um, we saw this morning the President Mario Brito. We also uh, had already the privilege to hear from Marna Magarosi, our Vice President. We have with us uh, Norbert Zenz, our treasurer. Thank you. And thank you, uh, especially Norbert, for having worked so hard so we could have these conditions all together. Thank you so much. But I would like also to highlight the national chapters. I don't know if all of them are here right now, but uh, we have representatives from uh, almost uh, all of our national chapters, with the exception of uh, the Czech Republic, could not be present. From Austria, we have Oliver Fitchberger, the Secretary General, with his invitee, Alfred Suare. From Bulgaria, Tsanko Mitsev, with his invitee, Viktor Danielov. Thank you for coming. From France, you knew Pedro Torres, and we are going to have the privilege of hearing this afternoon um, Reverend Francois Claveroli. From Germany, Jens Mohr, with his invitee, Ralph Grunka. From Italy, Davide Romano and Francesca Evangelisti, with the invitee, Professor Silvia Bladassare. From Portugal, uh, José Lagoa, the Secretary General, Ezequiel Duarte, and their, uh, their invitees, Joana Barata and Magda Ribeiro. From Romania, Aurel Niato, the president of Constantia in Libertate, uh, which is the association there, and Dragos Musat, as Secretary General. From Spain, Oscar Lopez, and the Secretary General, Ruben Guzman. And from Switzerland, Rafael Nagel, Nagler, the Secretary General. So I salute you all. Thank you for coming. You're hosting also this, um, this conference, and it's important that everybody uh, will meet you during the sessions. And I give the floor now to Jens Mohr. Thank you. Thank you, Paolo. As you mentioned, we don't only have a, an issue with um, freedom of expression, but also with time restraints. So our f I'm very happy to have uh, all these experts here, these excellent women and men, um, teaching us and giving presentations. And we start this session with Peter Stilwell. Peter Stilwell is um, currently director of the Department of Ecumenical Relations and Interreligious Dialogue of the Roman Catholic Patriarchate of Lisbon. Uh, he holds a PhD in Fundamental Theology from the Gregorian Pontifical University in Rome. And from 2012 to 2020, he was rector of the University of St. Joseph in Macau, China. So his topic will be the stones will cry out, the irrepressible call of conscience. Dr. Stilwell, the floor is yours. Well, I slipped away at lunchtime uh, to try and turn my, my talk into a 15-minute talk and to produce a PowerPoint as that might help. And uh, we start with, as you know, this quotation, uh, the title of my talk is taken from this moment in which Jesus enters Jerusalem and uh, the Pharisees, uh, some Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, teacher, rebuke your disciples, I tell you. He replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, if you had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. Who are we? Are we the Jerusalem whose eyes don't see? Are we the Pharisees who think that uh, the, the crowd is a bit noisy and out of, out of order? Uh, or are we the crowd? Um, 
we are probably all of these. Um, so when I look at the issue um, that was raised, uh, this issue of freedom of religion and freedom of, ex of expression, um, I tend to go back to something earlier. I think that um, we need to realize that religion and faith are not something which is sitting on the edge or somewhere within society. It is really uh, an expression of something which is the, the foundation of community life, which is faith. In other words, uh, what uh, we in theology divide into fides, cred, fides qua credimus and fides que credimus, the faith with which we believe and the faith in which we believe, uh, these are uh, dimensions which are transversal to all society. Uh, if we drill down to the primary foundations of our being in the world, we will find that life itself is rooted in trust or mistrust. We would not have fed on our mother's breast if something deeply embedded in us had not told us that she was trustworthy and that to suckle would soothe our hunger for food and comfort. We would not get out of bed in the morning if we did not trust that life had something to offer us. We trust that the sun will rise and set as expected. The farmers trust that spring will follow winter and that it is worth tilling and sowing the fields. So if uh, there was no trust, faith, confidence, things would start coming to pieces. Uh, when we break down this network of trust and confidence, things begin to fall apart. We all remember the recent ideologically driven budget put forward in Britain by Liz Truss. On paper, it might have worked, but she forgot that the economy is not an inanimate or mechanical object. It is a convenient word we use to denominate a complex network of human relations. She lost the confidence of the markets, we say, and Britain lost billions of pounds almost overnight. In fact, she lost the confidence not of the inanimate shares or financial bonds, but of those who buy and sell them. The confidence of the markets collapsed because people didn't trust her. Uh, perhaps they forgot to put a T on the end of Liz Trust's name. Um, anyway, um, our, as we look out on the world, we uh, see it from our own perspective, and that is uh, this idea of conscious, of being conscious is, in English, uh, sort of an ambivalent word. Uh, to be conscious is to be aware, not to be asleep. Um, but to have a conscience means something else. And to have a conscience is not something that's just stuck there in our minds. Uh, it is a way of expressing something which is, is deep down inside us, uh, that we are connected to other people and that there is uh, some form of awareness, which may be greater or lesser, that we are connected to other people and to the world in general, and so that our decisions are going to be in harmony or disharmony with the world around us. And uh, uh, if we push this to the limit, as we do uh, in our religious confessions, uh, in our religious traditions, we push it, it postulates that there is a knowing of the world which uh, sees that all is good. In other words, uh, there is a call for us to move uh, spiritually away from ourselves to another center, to see things from somewhere which is not just our own interest. However, we do look out on a horizon. You are looking at me, I am looking at you, we are seeing different things. If we talk together, uh, maybe I will get a bigger picture of what is actually going on, uh, and I'll understand the world better. Uh, so this is the challenge 
that I think is present when we feel this tension when we talk about freedom of religion and freedom of expression is are we allowing people to express what they are seeing from their various centers uh, and the horizons, what they are seeing? Is there a fusion of horizons going on between us? Are we being able to dialogue in such a way that we are able to see things in a wider perspective because we are not only seeing it from our own perspective? Um, and uh, I put there on the side uh, just as a provocation, uh, we all know about being woke and the uh, criticism about woke, but the origin of the, the expression is very interesting. It's not so far from the evangelical uh, perspective that we, we must be vigilant to be awake, to be awoken, or in Afro-American style, to be woke, to be, have been woken up. Uh, in other words, um, Perhaps what happens, what uh, uh, is uncomfortable for uh, long-standing traditions is that uh, someone is speaking from a different perspective which we haven't been listening to for carefully. And perhaps they don't speak in the same way, perhaps they are rude, perhaps they are loud, perhaps it's uh, upsetting. Um, but uh, it is a challenge, a challenge to do something which I found very interesting when I was reading uh, the, the Muradaj, no, the, the Vida of uh, Saint Teresa of Avila. Uh, as she progresses through uh, the seven levels of uh, the interior life, uh, carrying out a sort of geography of our spiritual, uh, spiritual life, she... Um, she picks up, she starts with the idea of a caterpillar. Myself is a caterpillar, uh, struggling to move across the plants and so on and so forth. And then when she gets to the fourth murada, the caterpillar enters a chrysalis and seems to be falling to pieces and being changed. And then in the fifth, or the sixth and seventh, uh, uh, Muradas, uh, it has turned into a butterfly, and the butterfly is being carried by the Spirit of God. And so um, it is an interesting uh, image. And why do I bring it in here? Because um, when we uh, are trying to bring together our centers, so to speak, our perspectives on the world, uh, we must remember that this is also a spiritual challenge. It's not just an issue of listening to what people are putting on paper. Are we being transformed interiorly from being an I looking out on the world to be becoming a we? Uh, are we somehow inhabited also by those we represent? Uh, are we uh, being a truly living conscience within the society? Um, so that is my, uh, my pictures. And now just uh, to quote Benedict XVI. I think it is interesting to quote him because he uh, came at this issue of uh, interreligious dialogue and uh, freedom of religion very much from a theologian's point of view, uh, rather abstract. And then, as you all remember, when he became pope, uh, he, he wasn't very careful about the examples he gave, and there was a lot of noise around it, uh, and the, his famous Regensburg speech. And uh, then the Muslim community got together, and they, did, uh, they wrote him a letter, uh, explaining that Islam was not what he thought. And uh, he, he listened to them, and uh, gradually we see him develop. And this is towards the end of his time as Pope, uh, when he was just finished um, signing the exhortation, um, uh, apostolic exhortation after the Synod on the <coughs> Middle East. And he talks about religious freedom, and he says, religious freedom is the pinnacle of all freedoms. It is sacred and inalienable right. It includes, on individual and collective levels, the freedom to follow one's conscience in religious matters, 
freedom of worship, freedom to choose the religion which one judges to be true, and to manifest one's belief in public. It must be possible to profess and freely manifest one's religion and its symbols without endangering one's life and personal freedom, as you will realize when this is said in an exhortation on Ecclesia in Medio Oriente, this has particular relevance. But he then moves on to the issue of, uh, which is at the center of our discussion, the issue of, of truth. Uh, there is need to move beyond tolerance to religion, to religious freedom. In other words, tolerance to religion, move on to religious freedom. Taking this step does not open the door to relativism, as some would maintain. It does not compromise belief, but rather calls for a reconsideration of the relationship between man, religion, and God. It is not an attack on the foundational truths of belief, since despite human and religious divergences, a ray of truth shines on all men and women. This is part of our patristic tradition in, in the Catholic Church. Uh, in other words, uh, when we speak to people from other religious traditions, there is something, some light that we will learn from them that we are not seeing ourselves. And I finish my last slide and what I think is the most important. We know very well that truth apart from God does not exist as an autonomous reality. If it did, it would be an idol. The truth cannot unfold except in an otherness open to God who wishes to reveal his own otherness in and through my human brothers and sisters. Hence, it is not fitting to state in an exclusive way I possess the truth. We come close to what the um, uh, a professor in the previous, Professor Moa, Maos was saying about the Jewish tradition of discussion. The truth is not possessed by anyone. It is always a gift which calls us to undertake a journey of ever closer assimilation to truth. Truth can only be known and experienced in freedom, and for this reason we cannot impose truth on others. Truth is disclosed only in an encounter of love. And that is the challenge. And as far as religious freedom on the law books and uh, freedom of expression can contribute to that, uh, that is great. But this is the heart of the matter, as far as I can see. Thank you so much. Dr. Stilwell, for your important <laughs> words and your time-restricted words. 15 minutes, wow, thank you so much. <laughs> Our next presenter will be Francois Claveroli, and uh, we are happy to have him here. He is pastor of the United Protestant Church of France and has been president of the Federa Fédération Protestante de France from 2013 to 2022. He's a member of the Council of the Communion of Protestant Churches in Europe, and he will speak in French to us. So uh, prepare your headsets, because his talk will be uh, translated into English. His topic will be freedom of worship and religious expression, the evolution of the law in France as a sign of an evolution of mindset. We are happy to hear you. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le modérateur. J'aime beaucoup le, le texte de la Pentecôte où chacun entend parler dans sa propre langue. Mais dans le livre des Actes, il n'y a pas d'ange qui, qui traduise. Il n'y a pas besoin d'ange. Ici, nous avons trois anges qui traduisent et je voulais les remercier en votre nom à tous. Le sens de mon intervention se veut à la fois comme une alerte et comme un encouragement. Tout d'abord, il s'agit d'une alerte sur les risques liés à l'évolution de plus en plus critique 
du regard porté par un grand nombre de nos contemporains sur la religion dans le monde. Et qu'il s'agisse d'intellectuels, de responsables politiques, d'élus, de croyants engagés dans leur propre confession. Il s'agit donc d'une alerte à ce sujet et puis il s'agit aussi d'un encouragement à œuvrer malgré tout pour la défense de la liberté religieuse, puisque c'est le propos de l'association, œuvrer pour la défense de la liberté religieuse et ceci malgré, malgré ce que donnent à voir les religions un peu partout dans le monde ces derniers temps, comme s'il fallait défendre les religions ou la liberté de la religion contre les religions elles-mêmes et contre leurs propres démons. À partir de l'exemple récent tiré du contexte français, à savoir le vote de la loi du 24 août 2021, alors le 24 août, c'est la Saint-Barthélemy en France, mais les législateurs n'ont pas fait exprès. C'est un hasard du calendrier. Cette loi du 24 août avait pour objectif de mieux lutter contre la menace du séparatisme. Si vous connaissez ce mot de séparatisme, c'est la tentation de vivre sa citoyenneté en dehors, en dehors des principes républicains. Et je noterai donc à la fois cette évolution et cette nécessité de plaider pour la liberté de culte et je conclurai par l'expression de cette alerte et de cet encouragement. Le protestantisme français a toujours euh, euh, exprimé son attachement aux valeurs de la République. Il n'a jamais cessé d'affirmer son rôle de vigie de la République face à toute atteinte qui pourrait affaiblir ses valeurs. Et ce rôle de vigie de la République, le président de la République l'a même euh, exprimé dans un de ses discours officiels lors des 500 ans de la réforme à l'hôtel de ville de Paris, lorsque je l'avais invité. Alors nous sommes vigiles de la République. Et voilà qu'une loi, la loi du 24 août 2021, contrecar, critique, critique, met en cause, d'une certaine manière, la liberté de religion. J'aimerais rapidement vous dire les quatre points sur lesquels cette loi interroge les chrétiens, pas seulement les protestants, mais aussi les catholiques, les orthodoxes, puisque protestants, catholiques et orthodoxes, nous sommes allés jusqu'au Conseil constitutionnel. Ça, ce n'était pas dans le texte, alors Pedro est perdu, ça y est, mais ce n'est pas grave. <rires> Quatre points, et après, je vous dirai les conclusions. Le premier point, c'est l'obligation de signer ce qui est appelé un contrat d'engagement républicain prévu à l'article 6 pour toutes les associations. Un contrat d'engagement républicain pour toutes les associations 1901, c'est-à-dire la vie associative en France, en subordonnant le versement des subventions publiques au respect de ce contrat qu'il faut signer. Et les protestants ont dit, mais attention, il y a des associations qui par leur action, sont à la limite lorsqu'ils aident, par exemple, des réfugiés, des étrangers, des migrants. Est-ce que, à cause de cette action limite, on va leur supprimer les subventions Ça, c'est la première chose. Deuxième point, la vérification par les services fiscaux de la régularité des reçus émis par les associations culturelles, c'est-à-dire par les paroisses. Et cette vérification est de nature à porter atteinte à la liberté de conscience et à la liberté de culte, puisque le législateur peut trouver les noms, par cette vérification, de ceux qui cotisent à leur église. Le troisième point, c'est l'obligation aux associations culturelles, c'est-à-dire aux paroisses, de se déclarer tous les cinq ans auprès du préfet, c'est-à-dire auprès de l'État. Et ici, il y a donc, au fond, un agrément administratif, un agrément administratif à la place de la simple et essentielle liberté d'association. Et puis le quatrième et dernier point, ce sont les nouvelles dispositions 
pesant sur les associations culturelles, donc les paroisses, bénéficiaires d'argent étranger. Et l'article 33 donne obligation de faire certifier les comptes par un commissaire aux comptes, et là, ça coûte de l'argent, pour vérifier d'où vient l'argent de l'étranger. Alors, vous comprenez que ce quatrième point vise en particulier l'islam. D'où vient l'argent des mosquées Pour le protestantisme français, l'argent de l'étranger, il vient d'Allemagne, il vient de Suisse, il vient des États-Unis, il vient de, je sais pas où, de Hollande, parfois. Pour les catholiques, il peut venir du monde entier, pour les orthodoxes aussi. Et cette vérification est donc un contrôle. Voilà ce que je voulais vous dire. Au fond, cette loi, euh, pour la première fois depuis 1905, veut contrôler le culte au lieu de le laisser libre. Et plus que le contrôler, fait a priori peser un soupçon sur la religion. Et ce n'est pas un hasard si en France, les cultes sont sous la responsabilité du ministère de l'Intérieur. Voilà ce que je voulais dire sur cette loi. Je ne veux pas en rajouter, mais j'aimerais terminer au fond en disant que, au fond, cette alerte concernant le travail législatif exprime une évolution de l'état d'esprit en France et en Europe où la religion est considérée comme quelque chose qu'il faut contrôler parce que c'est potentiellement une menace. Et il faut dire, et ce sera la pointe de mon discours, que les religions elles-mêmes ne contribuent pas à leur propre défense. Au contraire, dans la mesure où des crimes sont commis au sein de leurs propres institutions, par leurs responsables, je parle de crimes, pas de petits délits, de crimes, où l'on parle de crise systémique, pédophilie, agression sexuelle, emprise spirituelle, ou encore lorsque de graves défauts sont constatés dans la formation intellectuelle et personnelle des cadres, ou lorsque sont révélés des faits de corruption et des scandales, ou encore lorsque ces religions, comme on le voit aujourd'hui même en Russie ou ailleurs, se laissent instrumentaliser par le pouvoir politique au point de se compromettre dans des discours injustifiables et dangereux. Défendre la liberté religieuse est une noble cause qui doit passer nécessairement par la lutte contre les propres démons de la religion. Telle est l'une des tâches les plus urgentes au sein de chaque culte, car tous, tous sont concernés, islam, christianisme, judaïsme, bouddhisme, hindouisme, tous, sans exception aucune, sans exception. Et l'encouragement, parce qu'il faut être positif, L'encouragement, c'est que la religion est une ressource inestimable en humanité. Vous l'avez tous exprimé euh, depuis ce matin. Elle tente de rendre compte depuis le fond des âges et par le truchement à la fois de la raison, du récit, de la poésie et du mythe de ce qui constitue notre préoccupation ultime. La religion veut par le rite et le symbole inscrire au cœur de la culture le culte de l'accueil de l'autre avec un petit « a » et l'accueil de l'autre avec un grand A. Un culte qui voudrait... Une culture, pardon, qui voudrait exculturer le culte se prépare donc à des lendemains barbares. Ce sera le, le mot de, de la fin. Euh, notre société qui se sécularise de plus en plus et qui voit la religion comme une menace a envie de l'exculturer. Des sociétés ont déjà essayé de supprimer le culte. Des cultures ont déjà essayé d'exculturer les cultes. Et c'est la barbarie qui est venue. Alors, je vous encourage 
encore plus à lutter pour la liberté religieuse. Je vous remercie. Uh, for me, it is a great honor and pleasure to be able to speak in the uh, Golbekian Museum. This is the one building on earth where I have had the feeling of being important and respected. The only building on earth where I've had that feeling. And let me explain. Uh, about eight years ago, I was invited to uh, the University of Lisbon to give a presentation on uh, secular states. And one of the people on the panel, well, I should back one step, uh, I thought when I was invited that this would be a good chance for me to come to the Gulbenkian Museum, which I had long wanted to see and had never seen. So for me, coming to Lisbon, the presentation, OK, that's fine. But really, it was to come to the Gulbenkian Museum. Well, by coincidence, one of the people on my panel was the former president of the Gulbenkian Foundation. So I told him that I was interested in coming to this museum, and he said, well, let me make some arrangements for you. So I came to the museum. Uh, he was not there that day, but the director of the museum was there and a, uh, a other high official, and they gave me a personal tour of the museum. Then they took me to lunch in the private dining room, and then they gave me books from the, from the bookstore, and I felt as though I was a very important person. As soon as I left the building, I returned to the status that I have never since uh, attained. Anyway, it is a <laughs> pleasure for me to, uh, to be here. I'm going to talk about French laïcité. Uh, the translation of that word in English is typically secularism. But in France, laïcité means something a lot more and different from secularism. So I'm going to use the French term. If you have to translate into English or into Portuguese, we could say secularism. But really, it's some kind of uh, thought that's different. Uh, I'd like to make reference to the, the previous panel where uh, uh, Ganun spoke to us about the core values of belief and conscience almost as if he were Immanuel Kant explaining these things to us. Then Elisabetta spoke afterwards where she talked about the persecution of religious groups and religious people in Europe. They were talking, both talking about religion, both talking about freedom of religion. They were talking about two very different things, I think. Uh, a few years ago, I was asked by the Office of the UN High Commissioner for uh, uh, Refugees to analyze uh, issues related to religion. And uh, they asked me to provide a definition. I said, you can't de define religion. They said, do you want to be paid? I said, yes. Yeah. So I then came up with something not of a definition, but more of an explanation. So I said, when we're talking about religious persecution or religious difficulties, we're really talking about three different aspects of religion. One of them is religion as belief. And I think that's what Ganun spoke about, is how important religion is as a belief system and the values that are associated with that. Another aspect of religion is religion as identity. And religion as identity is important to many religious believers, of course. But also, religion as, ident as identity is important to people who persecute other people based upon their religion. So I think when Elisabetta is talking about the, the attacks on mosques, the attacks on synagogues, probably the people who are doing the attacks are not religious scholars who uh, read the Torah and thought, I cannot abide by this religion. I am going to go attack a synagogue. Or by people who uh, did not, who had read uh, the Quran and thought, this is unacceptable. I'm going to attack a mosque. These were built by people who were attacking other people not because of their beliefs, which they probably didn't know, but because of what those people represented to them, some kind of an identity. So in, in one sense, Ganun and Elisabetta are talking about the same thing. In another sense, they're talking about two entirely different things. And I think it's important to keep that in mind when we talk about roles of state and when we talk about religious persecution, that there are different things going on. And maybe it's not respecting religious beliefs, that is the problem. Maybe it is not liking the identity of somebody who appears to be different or who uh, your symbols seem to be offensive to. 
Now we're going to talk about France today, and I'd like to say that I'm entirely in agreement with uh, what Francois just said about the law. I will note that although it was uh, completed on August 24th, the Massacre of saint Barthélemy, uh, it was also published on uh, August 25th, which is my birthday. So in honor of me, also the feast day for Saint Louis of France, so we have a little bit of a uh, difficulty there. Now, laïcité in France, I think, is being used, the concept of laïcité is being used to engage in the second form of religion, or this dealing with the second issue. It is religion as identity, and it is using the powers of the state and state institutions and state broadcasting ultimately to attack other people based on religion. Now, it's doing it in neutral language, but there's nothing unusual about using neutral language to attack a despised group. Usually, we don't say, we're going to attack you because we hate this group is we're going to attack you because somehow you seem different to us. Your symbols, uh, wearing a headscarf on the public space in France is, be is making us uncomfortable. That is the reason that we will be uh, attacking you. Okay, now prior to the year 2004, uh, the term laïcité had been defined and described many times by uh, the French institution probably most responsible legally for defining this is by the Conseil d'État, so the High, uh, high Administrative uh, Council. The con Conseil Constitutionnel had not really dealt with this issue, but the Conseil d'État had dealt with this issue many times. And the issue became prominent in France, particularly after 1989, when there started to be an issue about Muslim schoolgirls wearing headscarves in French schools. Now, prior to 1989, it had been entirely permissible under French law for Jewish boys to wear the kippah, for Sikhs to wear uh, the kirpan, uh, and for uh, Muslims to wear the headscarf. Prior to 1989, that was French law. And the Conseil d'État, in more than 40 decisions, arrêt in French, more than 40 decisions between 1989 and 2004 said, Muslim schoolgirls have the right to wear headscarves in public schools in France. And the Conseil d'État uh, uh, specified that they can préciser, so I'm having a French problem. Okay, so they specified that the reasons for, reasons for this is one, under the French doctrine of laïcité, laïcité protects the right of French Muslim schoolgirls to wear the headscarf. That's French law. They also said under the Constitution, the Constitution of 1946 and 1958, both of which said that France is a laic state. Didn't say France is a state that has laïcité as a doctrine. They said that the French state is laic. So that the state is the one that's supposed to be laic, not the population, not Muslim schoolgirls. So the Conseil d'État said, and under international law. So under international law, under the French doctrine of laïcité, and under the French constitution, Muslim schoolgirls have a right to wear the headscarves. Okay, up until 2004, that was le legally defined laïcité in France. Well, something happened in 2003, 2004, and there became a cause uh, provoked initially by the events of 1989 and the Muslim schoolgirls, another story that we won't uh, deal with, but it became very prominent in the year 2003 as the issue became politicized in France. And it became politicized as of we need to protect French laïcité, and that's, what's going, that's what we are going to do. Okay, now the French, I'm, going, I'm exaggerating here, not all French agree, obviously, uh, but the, uh, in France it is widely believed that uh, laïcité is a founding principle of the French state. So laïcité is, is widely revered, uh, and I have heard that so many times that it would be nice to find a dissenter to that just for, the, just for the sake of seeing a dissenter, but laïcité is important to France. I'd like to give you some of the examples, and these were used during the year uh, 2003 by uh, then, uh, then uh, Minister of the Interior, uh, Sarkozy, then President of France, uh, uh, Chirac, then French Prime Minister Raffarin. This is how they describe laïcité. And although these are coming from 2003, 
The same thing is said last year, the same thing is said other times. So these are uh, some terms. Somehow the printing is very small. Okay, so this is the president of France. Laïcité is inscribed in our traditions. It is the heart of our republican identity. It is a principle to which citizens should be faithful. So this is an obligation of the citizens. This is not a requirement of the French state, which is to be a laic state in the Constitution. This now becomes an obligation of citizens, if you're going to be a good citizen. It is in fidelity to the principles of laïcité. It is a cornerstone of the republic. So this is not just one little doctrine among others. This is the cornerstone um, uh, of, uh, it, partly these are the values that create France. France. It is a doctrine that protects basic rights. Okay, laïcité, 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 foundational for the French state, 2003. When the issue was, do we ban Muslim girls from wearing headscarves, this is the language that was used. Okay, uh, let's go on to Sarkozy. We could, there are many others we could do. Sarkozy. Um, uh, Laïcité is not a belief like others. It is our shared belief that allows others to live with respect for the public order and with respect for the uh, convictions of everyone. Uh, Jean Gamerink, who was a uh, conseiller d'état, so on the high administrative court, said, I want you to listen carefully to this. The French style of laïcité, uh, its originality, its subtlety, its finesse, and richness. Is he talking about a legal doctrine or is he talking about a perfume <laughs> or a wine? Subtlety, finesse, this is what, is what it means for France. Okay, so with this very subtle doctrine that you have in France, you then say Muslim appearances of religion that differ from the majority are no longer welcome. So during the de parliamentary debates in 2003, it was said, remember the French Conseil d'État had said that this was permit, the wearing the headscarves was permissible. A member of parliament said, if that's what the Conseil d'État thinks is laïcité, we're going to show the Conseil d'État what it really means, and the parliament changed the law. That's important now. Parliament changed the law of laïcité in 2004. So it's not as though laïcité is a founding principle of the French Republic that has been there from the beginning and that we all must adhere. It is something that meant something at one time prior to 2004, and it changed in 2004 to mean something else. All without saying, we are changing the definition of laïcité. It is saying, we are being faithful to the traditions of France with our <coughs> what is in fact a new interpretation of laïcité. So what is this laïcité that everyone adheres to? Well, there are different things that have been described. So uh, among others, it is often described as being partly a doctrine of the separation of religion and state. Uh, it is sometimes talked as freedom of conscience, uh, both separation of uh, churches and state, and freedom of conscience are in uh, the 1905 law, the, the, the most important, single most important law uh, regulating religion in France. Uh, neutrality of the state is another one. Uh, and uh, it has also come to mean particularly between 1882 and 1886, it meant that no longer can religious figures teach in public schools. So we're not going to have nuns or priests teaching in public schools. So we're going to lay aside the public schools. And it also meant there will be no teaching about religion, no doctrinal teaching of religion in French schools. That's 1882 to 1886 uh, that that came up. So we have these, there are other definitions that I could give, but uh, time uh, calls. Okay, so Fran the, the p politicians in France and the French leaders will say, laïcité is a unifying principle, this is a cornerstone. Well, I'm going to challenge that by saying laïcité is in fact confusion. It means many different things, and laïcité, as described in the various elements, is entirely contradicted by other things that happen in France. This is not a unified doctrine. This is a smorgasbord where some things are taken and other things are ignored. So let me give an example. So we can say in France, okay, there is a separation of religion and the state, uh, and uh, the state does not in get involved in religious activities, and, uh, and particularly since 2004, uh, the pub public space should be neutral. 
Okay, so a neutral public space, uh, the French state is secular, and uh, there's a separation of religion and state. Okay, well, in current French law, there are many, contra many conflicts with that. That's not a consistent doctrine in France. So if we look at all of the cathedrals, built in medieval cathedrals in France, built before 1905, who owns those? Well, it's the French state that owns those. All of those were seized. So this is not separation of religion and state. This is state seizure of religious properties. They're all owned by France. They're owned by, owned by the French state. That's not separation of religion and state. That is state owning religious properties. Uh, so uh, we can also say the, the Mosque de Paris, so the, the mosque in Paris. Well, who paid for that? Well, that was the city of Paris that paid for that. So that's not the French state, but that is uh, the, the political institutions of Paris. So this is not a separation of religion and state, but it is uh, something else. The Loi de Bray, de Bray in 1959, it allowed for state financing of religious schools. Okay, that's still the law in France. That is entirely in conflict with what the politicians will say, but they didn't repeal the Loi de Bray. They decided that Muslim schoolgirls could not wear the headscarf to class. So they didn't say we're gonna make everything consistent and we're gonna have separation of religion and state, uh, separation of church and state, no financing of religion. Well, there's some that we will finance and some that will not. And fully in contradiction. One of my favorite examples of this confusion in France is uh, one of the most famous monuments in Paris, so the Pantheon in Paris, so the Pantheon, which is one of the great monuments to the Laic state of France. And so for the traditions where many of the great heroes of the French Republic are interred, including Jules Ferry, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so this is an important place in France. Well, what is this building that it symbolizes the French state. Well, it was formerly a church, the Church of Saint Geneviève. Okay, what stands atop the cupole in the Church of Saint Geneviève? There's a Christian cross right up there, French state owned monument with the cross in a very public space. Okay, now how do we explain that? Go inside the, the Pantheon, I almost said go inside the church, which it actually looks like on the interior, and there are paintings by Pouvid Chavan which show the traditional relationship between the French state and the Roman Catholic Church. So dozens of paintings. In the place where the altar was originally constructed, there's a statue of Marianne, the virginal uh, uh, symbol of France, sort of Marie, but now she's Marianne. Okay, so she's right in the place of the altar and she is wearing, go look for yourself, she's wearing a headscarf. Uh, now, it's not the bonnet rouge, it's really she's wearing a headscarf. Okay, so we have this, uh, this mix-up. So we have the cross, we have uh, Pouvid Chavan paintings, we have Marianne, uh, all contradicted by what this doctrine is supposed to be clear, so that we can pick things that we want, choose things that we don't want. What about other things? What about the, t the, uh, province or the region of Alsace-Moselle? Uh, Alsace Okay, so a region in eastern France, the law of 1905 does not apply in Alsace-Moselle. Now, there's a historical reason for that. Alsace and Moselle were not part of France when the 1905 law was passed. Okay, I understand. But in, but in Alsace-Moselle, the French state subsidizes uh, religion at public schools. And the state also finances religion. Now, that is in conflict with these beautiful notions of what France is. But when the parliament enacted the law in 2004 to prevent schoolgirls from wearing the hijab, they didn't fix up these other problems. So they put the weight of the French state not to clean up these contradic contradictions with laïcité, but they put the full power of the French state on schoolgirls to say, you can't do this. And they did this in the name of, we're going to protect these young girls. And how are we protecting these young girls? so they're not being forced to wear the headscarf. So what are we going to do to protect them? We're going to force them not to wear headscarves. They don't solve the underlying problem. And they do also do this. If those French schoolgirls do not accept this law, they will be expelled from school. So how is this trying to bring citizens together, unifying principle? What I think is that we have here something that is more akin to taking this identity of Islam, identity of something that appears to be different to us, different for us, we're going to enact a series of laws, uh, probably the worst of which is the law that was enacted uh, last year that you've, we've had talked about, so I don't need to go into that further. So here we have laïcité 
uh, by a French secular state, uh, nothing inherently wrong with secularism. What is wrong is if we have a regime acting in the name of secularism that in fact discriminates, and it discriminates, it targets those groups that are the least favored. It is not a neutral law, it is targeting particular groups. So France had the problem during the 1980s, that continues to uh, today, with what they called the sects, or the dérives sectaires. So these, uh, these, uh, these groups with their gurus, so this is, this is a group being tacked. 1980s, that was the issue, early 1990s, then it became Islam that was the issue. This is not neutrality, this is not consistency, this is not a consistent doctrine in France, this is a smorgasbord, we will take what we like, and we will ignore what we don't like. Uh, one thing I meant to say earlier, and I'm going to end, uh, th this is totally out of place, uh, just a couple of examples of books. So this is Henri Peña Ruiz, one of the uh, uh, soi experts in France on laïcité. So he writes, Dictionnaire amoureux de la laïcité. Love dictionary for laïcité. You now that sounds like you love a wine, not like you love a law. Uh, and after the law of uh, tw 20, uh, 21 was adopted, uh, 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 a brochure was created uh, called Pour aimer la laïcité, to love laïcité. Uh, this is how we are going to treat it. So this is being treated as though it's something special. It's not laïcité that they love, it is despised groups that they want to uh, attack. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Gan. You gave us stuff to ponder. We have some remarks by Susanna Machado. Susanna Machado is professor of law at the Polytechnic Institute of Porto in Portugal, and she has specialized in labor law. And she is a member of the Council of Experts of the AIDLR. The floor is yours. We are happy to hear your, your remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moore, for giving me the floor. And dear colleagues, dear friends, let me begin by thanking you, Mr. Paulo Macedo, that you are arriving, <laughs> for the excellent organize, organization of this conference. And I now, have the, I now have this very difficult task, make these final remarks of the session that it was real with such high quality. I promise uh, I won't spend a lot of time because here at this building, I'm not uh, so important as Jeremy. So let's start. I, I thank you all for the, the brilliant presentations you have provided us. And we have learned new ideas from you, which we could adopt to further improve our work and reflections in this important area of our lives. I do know that we are going to have many interesting and useful presentations during these two days, but in my view, some of the most interesting topics in this area were addressed in this session. Maybe because I had to be attentive to make these, these remarks, I don't know. And I believe that many good experiences have been shared and good lessons uh, we have learned. I have taken some notes, but they will certainly be lacking in view of the quality of these presentations. Mr. Stilwell comment on Luke's passage, the stones will cry out. It's easy to pass by this interaction and focus mostly on the idea of stones crying out. We think of it as a poetic image because we all know stones don't make noise, except when they do. And some of us can hear it. After this presentation, I can hardly imagine the sound that hood produce with massive rocks tumbling and cracking. And in metaphorical terms, this is indeed a call from our conscience that must be respected and preserved. Then, after listening to Mr. Clave Rolli, words on a subject that particularly interests me, I must highlight the problems revolving around French 
laicity, I don't know if it's a good pronunciation. <laughs> um, in fact, France is trying to take some steps to build an authentically human society. But we must remember that the Republic is secular, but French society is not. And then, as Professor Jeremy Gunn's presentation, so what can I say? <laughs> Jeremy is an expert on the principle of secularism, a deep expert of the French reality, and we learned a lot about differences in the meaning of laicity, freedom of religious expression, and human dignity. dignity. Professor Gunn presented an alternative way of thinking about French controversy around the concept of laicity in order to respond to religious diversity. I now conclude by thanking you all for your contributions to further reflection and to build a more inclusive world. Thank you. Thank you so much to the presenters for keeping the time. And we now have at least five minutes, I guess, for Q&A. So Ganun Diop is one of the first. Uh, maybe we can have the ushers um, taking the microphone to you. And you have the microphones in front of you. Please take them, and then uh, we'll have um, the answers. So uh, Ganun first, and then uh, Mr. Maos. Is this next. working? Yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. OK. Uh, Thank you very much to all um, the speakers. I wanted to ask Jeremy a question. You know, he has uh, described, uh, <clears throat> if I was bold enough, I will almost put a new title to your presentation, like instrumentalization of laicity by the French government, for example, right? <laughs> okay, so allow me to picture something like, and I would like to know what you think, in fact, uh, two sociologists, Olivier Bobineau, um, and uh, then uh, also, well, said the following. Um, the other one in, is uh, Stéphane uh, Latian. They distinguish French laicite, you know, since the law 1905, as follows. You have what they call laicite of opposition, the first one, which is, is essentially characterized by resistance right, and militancy against the influence of a religious denomination on civil society, one. Two, laicity of proposition, uh, which is considered the heart, they say, of French law aimed at securing freedom of conscience and a guarantee of freedom to practice one's religion. You also have what they call laicity of differentiation. This time, this aspect emphasizes the neutrality of the state. Now, you are, you are mentioning that this has been transgressed, uh, uh, especially against Muslim, I mean, uh, Islam and, uh, and so forth. Completely agree. And then uh, there is another aspect. The fourth one is what they call laicity of composition. This time, it allows cooperation between the state and religious institution. Is this analysis from two sociologists um, wishful thinking, or is this something that is a reality in spite of the instrumentalization by successive government in, uh, government in France? Your opinion. Yeah. Uh, so I use the, the uh, metaphor smorgasbord for uh, laicite. You can pick what you want and use that. Jean Bobereau uh, identified seven versions of laicite. The, the ultimate issue, in my opinion, is laicite is not a defined legal concept. It is more of a moral sentiment or a value sentiment, and it can be used to mean many different things. I mean, some things that happen in the name of laicite, I personally would completely uh, agree with. Some things that happen in the name of laicite, I think, is uh, are abominations. Those can be used. So the state can uh, work with religious groups if it chooses to do so. There's nothing that I think of in laicite that prevents that. 
though there is something in some people's beliefs. But ultimately, it means so many different things, and it can be used uh, to justify prejudices, or it can be used for, uh, to justify other politics. It, it's just a, a, it's a broad term. <laughs> Uh, so the 1905 law called the law on the separation of churches and the state, uh, interestingly, uh, never uses the word sep separation in the text of the law. It's only in the title. Now, it was, I think, uh, I mean, this can be a, a debate, I think it was to, uh, to weaken the, Catholic, the role of the Catholic Church in France. Now, that's not what the title of the law is, but I think that's what it was, is to, t is to take the Catholic Church, which had, you could say, a disproportionate amount of power in France, and it's to put it on a different uh, level. So uh, thing, I think it was largely an anti-Roman Catholic uh, law, but once again put in somewhat neutral terms. Mm, thank you. Professor Maus. Okay, thank you, Jeremy. I, I would like to pick up something that you said and sail with it over the ocean to the United States. What is neutrality and what do you really mean by that? Uh, I participated in a conference on the American wall of separation, and I said that America is a Christian society, a Christian state. They said, how dare you? I said, there is the letter by Justice O'Connor to a friend, and she writes, specifically, we are a Christian nation. And they said, oh, you don't do it in this country. You don't quote from private uh, correspondence. That is privacy. I said, I don't know what's privacy about correspondence of a chief justice on a legal matter, but why, why I quote this? And I brought them over quite a few uh, law opinions of the Supreme Court, not private correspondence. One, one said, this is a religious uh, nation. The other one said, this is a Christian nation. So, uh, and they speak about neutrality. And that's what I thought about when you spoke about the, the French neutrality. Uh, it's interesting that the United States is supposedly a neutral state with a religious society because the Americans are religious. On the other hand, when you sail again back to the United Kingdom, you come across a country that is perhaps the best manifestation of no wall of separation. As we know, King Charles is now head of the Anglican Church. We all remember that there was a doubt whether he can become king, not because he's not, he's not, he shouldn't be king, but how can he be head of the, of the yes. church after his episodes? <laughs> uh, on the other hand, by the way, I, I feel sorry for my friends who have the silk. They had all to change the letterhead from QC to KC. But uh, that's a different story. And on the other hand, I think the English are much less religious than the Americans. So it is a separation, which is not real separation, with a religious society and a non-separation with a secular society. Uh, there are statements uh, by Supreme Court justices where they said things like that, probably the most famous one. Many in the 19th century, in the 20th century, probably the most famous one was by Justice William O. Brennan. Uh, <laughs> William O. Douglas, sorry. And he later said that was one of the most stupid things he had ever written, but he did, he did say it in a Supreme Court. I, I didn't know you know, uh, he, he was not a stupid person, but he did say that, and he regretted it later. So there's people who make statements like that. That's true in terms of being, uh, and I think that there are social pressures and political pressures generally for that. It is not something that is embodied in law. So there are no, there are no statutes that say the United States is a Christian uh, nation, and there's nothing that says... And so we can provide funding for Christians, but not for others. So if that issue is, is problematic in the United States. I agree. It, the, the movement for people saying the United States is a Christian nation, so population, 
more people are saying that this year than last year and more that year than, than before. So it's moving in that direction. But it, but it is still a minority of the population. But people are saying that. Mm, OK. Yeah. court and ask them to let them open their shops on, sat on Sunday because they are losing on Saturday, the answer was, it's your problem. We are a neutral uh, uh, state. We don't interfere with religion. So uh, it's a neutral state. However, Sunday is Sunday. Sunday is not a Muslim day, not a Jewish day. It's a Christian day. I mean, you come and ask them, so let us make bread, uh, earn our bread on Sunday, they say, oh, no. And, they, and when they say, but we are religious, we can't open it on Saturday, they say, don't, don't tell us religious uh, doctrine. We are neutral. No, th that was the case in the United States. That largely ended about 20 years ago. But I mean, that's part of the legacy, but it's not part of the law now. OK. Thank you so much. And we are uh, thanking you all, all the presenters in giving you a round of applause. We also appreciated your leadership. Thank you, Jens. Um, I have some final remarks. Please bear with me for just two minutes. We are going to leave from here, all people at, uh, at the hotel, we are going to leave at a quarter to six, precisely, uh, at the reception where we arrived. So we can go slowly there, uh, enjoy some fresh air, not the sun anymore. But we are going to leave precisely at a uh, quarter to six. Um, tomorrow, please, to all those at the hotel, we are going to leave the hotel from, from who remembers, please? 8.20, thank you so much. Not 8.40, because we are going to start here at 9 o'clock sharp. So 8.20 tomorrow. I would like also to ask you, please, when we leave our rooms, don't forget the small device. We'll give it to you tomorrow again, but they need to be charged. And uh, please, uh, no, no, the, the, device, the earphones. Translations, okay? Please give it at the Secretariat when we leave. Um, see you tomorrow. Uh, congratulations for keeping the time, all of you, and uh, it was a very good day for us. Thank you. Bye-bye.